Welcome everyone. I hope everyone's having a good Tuesday. Um, I am Ash with TC Spotlight. Um, this is my Barry Justice series that I have. I have another series um, Spotlight, um, which I is my main series. Um, I pretty much spotlight true crime, um, and I just have two separate categories for for that. Um, tonight, I want to, you know, slow it down and run through Jane Jane Doe one transcripts of the uh, the. Um, I have been saying Galen Maxwell trial. Um, there's a lot of names out there. People have been calling her. Um, I haven't really been keeping up with headlines. I have been keeping up enough, um, which I feel that they have the same opinion as I do as far as the trial from what I can see. Um, and hopefully it just, it doesn't end the way that everybody I'm just, I'm just keeping the faith. I'm just keeping the faith here. <clears throat> and you'll see why, you know. Um, but I have been strictly going. Uh, everything that I'm doing here tonight is because of Christian T. Harris. He is actually in the courtroom. Um, he is the host of Rundown Live. Um, he provided the transcripts. Um, I am able to go through, I have written down page numbers and kind of bulletin and I've read, I've read through the transcripts and I went back through the transcripts. Um, so, and I will be dropping the transcript link. Um, so if anybody wants to go back through them, I really encourage you to, because there's just a lot of information in there, um, especially based on just reading the head, like, like I said, just reading the headlines is not enough. Um, we all, I, I think we all have a strong opinion that, man, what's happening with this case? And from reading the transcripts, I don't, I just, I'm just trying to keep the faith, you know, they're not really, they're just breaking my heart and I hope that's not the case. So we're just going to slow it down and go through them. What I want to do is go through all the transcripts that he has provided. Um, you should actually follow him here. I'll pop this up and pop me away real quick. Um, you should really follow him. He, like I said, he is inside the courtroom and he provided the transcripts that I have today that I'm going through. Um, you should follow him, like him, that is his, uh, the Rundown Live is his uh, website that he has. That's where the transcripts are. You can go there to read all of them that he's dropped. I know that there's talks that he is dropping um, the latest transcripts, which I cannot wait to read. I can't wait to read them all. Um, right now I'm going through the butlers. I'm doing the read through, and then I'll go back through and do the same exact thing that I'm doing here tonight. So if you like what I do tonight, um, like and follow, or like and um, follow or follow, um, share it. Um, I'm gonna kind of talk like some people don't know about the case so much, um, but yeah, really, really good, awesome guy. He's he has been covering the case from inside as well. Um, I was going to, I was gonna hop on the other a while ago and talk about it but a few things happened um like i was going to make this whole big spiel about where are the farmer sisters and then turns out they um had the younger farmer sister on so i'm glad i didn't do that and then um i seen Kristan. he was getting censored he actually had to fight a video that he was doing um and he's actually inside the courtroom. And then, you know, I'm sure people have read the Twitter article about the Twitter girl who was also in the courtroom. She was reporting daily. They suspended her account um, and suspended her from 
making any account. As far as I know, she's still on Instagram. Um, but yeah, it's a little nerve wracking because these people are inside the courtroom and they're reporting and they're getting censored. And, you know, as passionate as I am about this, um, it just has me a little nervous because of what I do for my spotlight series. You know, I would never want to for that to happen. So I figured, well, what the heck, why not read? What can they do if I'm reading straight from the transcript? So we'll see how it goes. Um, if you guys like this, um, like I said, I am reading the butlers now and we will do the same thing for every transcript. Um, I also want to say that if you are a, um, uh, I don't know how to put this, a, a Glean Maxwell supporter, this is probably not the video for you. Um, I totally support the victims. Um, they are very brave and I guess my, I, I speak for them. Like I said, even as we go through the transcripts, I know I'm not really going to pick apart the, the defense so much. Um, if there's something I feel I need to write down, I will, but you know, in my opinion only, um, as far as I'm concerned, um, between the prosecution not doing as much as I feel they should, or they aren't asking the questions I feel they should have. Um, I'm not, definitely not going to help the defense and put out anything that they try to pick apart. Because really with Jane Doe 1, all they're trying to do is, you know, why didn't you speak sooner? And as we go through the transcripts, you can clearly see why she felt at 14 that she couldn't speak. Um, and they just really try to come at it from a money angle, which, yeah, I'm just not going to help them on that. So um, this is just strictly informational. You know, all parties are innocent until proven guilty. Not that there's a lot of parties being said. Um, I also have written down names of people, um, you know, besides the names that we have already heard of repeatedly. Um, so I will be sharing that. Um, by the time I'm done, I just want to make a huge, put all this information in a huge timeline and put the people where they need to go in the right place at the right time and just kind of like chronological, like just, yeah, make a big, big timeline of it. Um, but this is just informational. These are just my opinions based around what I'm reading from the transcripts. Um, so I hope you like and follow and I will be, I'm a little into it. It'll probably be late like this. I don't know sporadically. I just don't know how to beat getting censored if that's what they're going to do. So I'm trying to just like pop on. So like and follow and look for me. Um, and we'll go through the butlers next. So for starters, like I wanted to talk about anyways, if you do not know, you should really go, um, this picture is from the, the series that they did on Netflix. I'm not sure what it is. Like I said, if you know the name, I've seen it. Um, I just don't, it's like filthy rich. I just don't want to get it wrong. Um, they were the very first to alert anybody of the situation that was going on with Jeffrey Epstein back in 1996. And then we also know about Virginia Gumphrey. She was another one, another first one to alert authorities, excuse me, back in the 90s. Um, I will be dropping links to where I've gotten the information but you can go online and I encourage you to read about them. Um, yeah, they were the very first back in 1996 and nothing was done. And it's just, as a person that can relate, um, yeah, 
I mean, sometimes nothing can get done. And it's, um, we all know uh, Ghislaine Maxwell is in for the, on trial for not only grooming, but engaging in these young, at the time, these young children or young women. Um, so she didn't just bring them in. She also, and you can clearly see as we go down, that she engaged in these acts. So that's what she is on trial for. So let's not forget that, that she engaged and you can clear They paint a picture. She was clearly involved. Also, I want to talk about the little black book, not the one that we know about. This one comes back in from the early nineties. Somebody I'll give you a rundown. Also, um, it'll be, I'll post the link for it. Um, it was found in the early 90s. It was pretty much authenticated. It was sold on eBay. It passed along. Um, it has known contacts of Jeffrey Epstein, you know, like his parents, like residents, addresses, phone numbers. From what I read, there are like some names that mesh between. The, and now this is predated from the 2004, I believe, book that we know about that we're talking about that we're all debating about. So this predates, and from what I understand, predates all Jane Doe's. So in this book, between the two books, there are similar contexts, and there are also names that we have never known before, that they have no, they, uh, from what it says, names that we didn't even know were connected to Jeffrey Epstein. So then there's, so there's that, there's a whole new book. You look that up, research that and bring that into, to the debate, big debate here. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I think, so they wanted to paint Glean as kind of a victim from what I, from what I've seen before the trial. And that's why I want to make it known why she's on trial. She didn't just groom, she acted, she communicated, she facilitated, and you will see that. Um, to me, if you want to ask me, she acted like what she thought that these young girls would act like. You know, they're young, they're impressionable. Um, I cannot remember his name but he is a model scout. I will have the name. I can't think of it off the top of my head. It is written down actually in my book of names here. Um, I don't know. Um, I will find him and it'll be, it'll be in the names that I, that I put out. Um, he, I do know he was some kind of model scout and I mean, just she, I just, I just want to make it very clear that she was not in any way a victim. She was very participating and engaging. And I think that she, just by the things that she wore behind the scenes, she wore the tank top. She wore the little, you know, and just I, a teenager, I think she tried very hard to fit into these little girls roles. Um, and, and that she was very complicit and she was very equal and she was not a victim. Um, Glean Maxwell, before she came to the States, her dad, she, they did have the status, they did have the money and they did have the power and the name and all of that good stuff. Her dad was a bulldog as far as the business world, so far as you know, being known as a bully, really hard to work with, really difficult. Um, but, you know, Glean, she just stood by his side. She learned from him. And, you know, he kind of too had this do whatever it takes to get the job done mentality. And by the time it was done, he was known 
from what I, you know, read Google's name, Robert, I think his name is Robert Glean, or Robert Maxwell. Um, he was known for a for fraud and for being a suspected spy. Um, and she just, she, you know, you can read from, she sat by his side no matter what he did. She just praised him. She learned from him. Um, she were, I think, at a moment in time, she helped run a little business for him. Um, she was just always there, always right by his side. So right before she moved from, from the States, they lost, or to the States, they lost everything. She lost the status, the money, the social life. Everything was gone. She still had the name. Um, her dad was in a yachting accident where he fell off the yacht and he did not make it. So when she came to the stage, she had nothing. But that was not for long. That's when she met Jeffrey. Um, he did not have the powerful name, but he did have the money. And a lot of people think that, oh, he did this whole sex ring thing for money. And I don't think it was about the money at all. I think he did. He cared less about the money. I think that he threw that money away so much on his lavish life. Yeah, but as well, he threw a lot of money into being able to hide what he was doing within those walls, within those yachts, within those, wherever he would, you know, the, the island. The So that's why I say he didn't care about the money. He cared about what the money could do. If that makes sense. That's just my opinion. Um, and Glenn cared about that, the money, the lifestyle, all those things, the flashy, the status, the social. So she didn't care what had to go on behind the scenes and then in fact engaged in what went behind the scenes in order to get that. I don't think she was a victim at all. Um, I apologize, I'm doing this by myself. So we kind of have to, I wanna run through the pictures um, and then I'll go back to them because they come up in Jane Wan's transcripts. You know, she paints a picture. Here's a pool house that she will describe, which I'll come back to. I just want to let you know, you know, my opinion is they are going about this as it was very localized, very isolated that these two perverted people <laughs> were, <clears throat> were preying on a small group of girls and they wanna show that, that they did this through a massage business, which all of that is true, yes, but that is not the full picture. That is not what all has happened. And, but then again, you know, they don't mention the names. They don't elaborate on any of the, of the people that Jane Doe says were involved in these acts, which we will see. Um, they don't talk about any of that, which makes me, and this is my, where my faith comes in. You know, I know that we know that behind the scenes, as far as investigations that we don't know everything. And I'm just praying that they are like teasing us with all these potential complicit people and they're not elaborating on, they're not asking about them. So I'm just hoping that it, but then a part of me is like, why would they bring everybody back and have trial after trial? Why not just blow it out the water on this one? So I don't know. I'm just trying to keep the faith here. I'm really rooting that by the time this is done, all these victims will say, yes, this is it. This is, you know, and I really think that this is a trial that could really set a tone for us as a nation. Um, there are pretty powerful names on there involved. No matter where they're sitting, they're all pocketing from the same little ring. And, you know, I've read, I've seen a lot of comments about, oh, it's political. I really don't think it is. I'm sorry. It is and it's not. I really think it's a people person within our politics and this case could take care of a lot of those people 
that are directly in those seats or pocketing those seats or, or, you know, the whole ring, a ring, the ring, not an isolated event, not two people preying on small group of children, you know, and uh, at least from what I've read with Jane Doe one, they make it very well known how connected they are. Can you imagine how intimidated that could be? So she talks about these rooms and the paintings. These ones are, um, must be, you know, Jane Doe one explains these, this room. I believe this is the New York residence that she was at. Um, she explains the pictures on the wall, explains the room. These are redacted. Um, I just wanted to walk through. That is a picture of Galene Maxwell on the wall. Um, you can find all these pictures online. I will drop the link for where I found these specifically um, afterwards. You have over on the wall to the left there, there are naked. And that's the thing. You use, that's what I don't understand. You step foot in this house. And you have to understand, like, not just the victims were in this house or the masseuses were in this house. These, the clients, anybody, anybody that stepped in that house, I feel would leave this house. And that's my point of these pictures. <clears throat> anybody that leaves this house over here, you have a, a, a headless, you know, knee calfless from the, you know, knee caps down this girl turned with her, but showing like, Anybody, and that's his office. Anybody that comes into this house and leaves is just dripping in questions, especially your first time, like, okay. You know, I'm just saying this in, in contrast to everybody that came into Jeffrey Epstein's life and Galene Maxwell's life closely enough to enter at least this residence. And they were everywhere, everywhere. You, you you can't leave this house in that question. Sorry. So I got all of these in here in the backyard by the pool. If you look, there's a statue of a naked woman, you know. Um, I just, I feel you worked for him, especially closely. You didn't know. And they should all be held accountable. And I just, I guess I'm asking where... Where is that? What's going to happen to all those people? So I have been writing everything down. Like I said, any names and um, things from Jane Doe One's um, testimony. Like I said, I'm not going over so much the defense picking her apart. I, I just feel like the, I just feel like it's, it, it, it's just been one big let down. Um, and I'm still keeping the faith though. I'm keeping it trying. So I went through and, you know, it starts out in the beginning. I started the, like the, you know, the good parts, if you want to say for lack of better word, um, starts around page 18 where I first kind of was just like, Oh, okay, here we go. Um, but before that, you know, they talk about the interlocking camp, the summer camp that she went to, and I, it, it's kind of confusing, so I just kind of want to clear it up. So she first went to this camp in 93. Um, her father passed away of leukemia, and her whole family pulled money together to be able to send her to this camp. So it was she was 13 at the time. That's when that happened. At the end of that time is when she first met Glenn Maxwell and then introduced, she brought in Jeffrey Epstein. Um, that's when they sat down, they talked to her, you know, about her goals, her dreams, what she wants to do. She talked about her father just recently passing away. Um, casual conversation. She doesn't say anything happens there. And then she goes home. It was a few weeks into school when her mother got the phone call from Jeffrey Epstein. 
So yeah, there was this whole, so, and it's kind of, that's why I wanted to say, cause when I, I didn't know that I thought it was all 94. Um, no. So what I'm guessing and I'm getting is originally met, she was maybe 14, but it was a 93 at the end of that summer camp that they, they met. Um, then it goes on to talk about, um, yeah, she had been at school and then uh, her mother went over to, as we know, went to the house. Now the butler, the butler says in his testimony, which I will, we will go over. Um, but I, like I said, I have started to read it. He kind of contradicts it a little bit, which, you know, either way. Um, but I just want to point it out that Jane Doe one says that her mother dropped her off once or came once dropped her off. And then she was alone, which this is a long time ago, you know? Um, and the butler says that it was a few times the mother came over. And then after that, she was alone. I think he's just trying to make the situation not look so bad for himself, if you ask me. Um, but Jane Doe says, you know, her mother came over, they talked. Um, you know, her mom was very supportive, you know, said that I, they were scouts, they were interested in her daughter, had the whole talk, then she went home, and then from then, the butler comes and picks her up from her house, takes her to Jeffrey's. This is the Palms, uh, the Palm Beach house in Florida. Takes her there, takes her to the airport, takes her around. Um, and you know he sees her, and if you, you ask him, she appeared to be fourteen to fifteen years old. So I just want to point that out. Um, so you know they pretty much go over that and um lead into the time there you know it, it jane one describes it as she went over there you know and it started out they would ask her about her dreams her goals it turned into they were paying for voice lessons paying for classes um it turned into she filled out the application for um the summer camp again for 94 and 95 and 96. Um, 94 was paid for by Jeffrey by that time. Um, so it was all casual, you know, all she said, you know, she was so happy they were interested in her. Um, when she would go over there, she at the pool area, she would see um, a bunch of the topless girls, including Glean Maxwell, everybody would be uh, topless over there. The butler in his testimony that I see corroborates that. Um, he says 95% of the time, everybody was topless around, around the house, lots of young women. Um, so she starts to see, you know, she sees that and when, Je when she starts to leave Jeffrey Epstein's house after every visit, he would hand her money. You know, I know you're struggling. I know your dad passed away. I know your mom needs it, or whatever. But each time he would give her money. Um, and she mentions that Jeff says, you know, you're 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 a good girl. You don't want to see that. And I could only assume that he's talk he's talking about the topless woman at the at the pool. Um, so that's pretty much what they talk about within like the first 17 pages, just kind of going back and forth, getting a feel for that. You know, they really kind of, I think, I think they're trying to paint a picture that they started grooming, you know, scoping her out at 13, you know, young, a whole time before 94 when she was a lot younger, which I mean, if she was 13 around that time, yeah. Um, interesting enough, the, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll start here. Okay. So on page 18, she states that 
they go from the grooming, then it goes to talking about boyfriends, and it gradually starts to turn sexual. Um, they asked her if she did have a boyfriend um, and all that good stuff at 14 years old, you know. I mean, could yeah, I mean, it's possible the, the whatever high school, 14 year old, whatever that is at 14. Um, but I'm getting the vibes that Jane was not, not, not into that. Um, I could be wrong, but she certainly didn't feel comfortable with what she was seeing, if you ask me. Um, so they're having this conversation and Jane one says that Galene Maxwell pretty much says to this 14 year old girl, it's okay once you them, you're grandfathered in. Meaning that you it doesn't matter. And you know, that is very suggestive to for what was to come. You know, that to me says making her it be okay after the first time it happens, you know, it won't matter after that. Just let it, you know. It already happened, so it doesn't count after that. So I thought that was very interesting. Then from page 20, on page 20, from 18 to 22 lines, if you're following, you know, if you go back and read it, they talk about the paintings and the sculptures that I was talking about. Um, and that is, you know, you can see one of the sculptures back in his window you know i'm assuming that there are many of them around you can see that it back in from the outside of the window there um the paintings on the wall she describes them very much um and then from page 22 this is where we start to get into the the pool house encounter that we we know about you know i just want to run through it quickly for like i said i kind of want to speak on you know not a lot you would be surprised on how many people i do n that haven't heard about it that i talked talk to so i kind of want to go through it just a little bit um on page 22 they talk about the pool house sexual encounter um you know, this is where, this is the pool house where she says that Jeffrey Epstein took her by the hand, led her out to the pool house. He took off his sweats. He sat down, he pulled her on top of her and he masturbated. <clears throat> and I cannot, I, I can very much imagine what she was going through at that time, especially at 14 years old. I can only imagine. And, and my heart just truly really breaks for her. I, I, yeah, I, and cause that's, you know, that's a lot of the talk of people. Why, why, why? Once she was 14, you know, we all know, we can all understand that people are, you know, of power and we can all, under, you know, we just, we don't need to go there too much, but that's where she says that the, again, the 14 year old Jane Doe first sexual encounter in 1994 was in Jeffrey Epstein's Palm Beach, Florida pool house. She also states that on page 23 that Jan joins in and she joins in in the bedroom in the Palm Beach house. She states on page 24 that um, GM or Glenn Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein showing 14 year old Jane Doe one how Jeffrey Epstein likes to be massaged, which she says is very hard. Um, his feet, she says that she had to really dig in there. He really liked it rough. Also, he liked his nipples twisted hard. Um, and while, and on page 26, J Jeffrey Epstein touched her breast 
and vagina. He used vibrators and massages in her vagina, even though it hurt. And Galene Maxwell would generally or generally touch her breasts while Jeffrey Epstein did this. On page 27, sexual encounters with GM and Jeffrey Epstein uh, while other people were present. She says this was between 14 and 15 years old. On page 28, massages in front of people would turn to full on orgies. Sex toys were used. Again, she says Jeffrey, she was used vibrators and massagers in, in her. Massages in front of people would turn into full owners. What I want to know is who are these people? As we go through her transcript, you clearly, she clearly paint, paints a message that there were other people involved. This was started out as just Jeffrey, then Glean, then people were brought in. Who? Who? Because those are the people that they're not talking about. And I'm really hoping it's because there's something, something bigger, something bigger behind the scenes. That's what I'm really hoping for. I'm just hoping that there is something else going on because everything from that I've read from these transcripts, there is nothing in there that states to me that they're trying to do anything about a sex ring. They are just clearly, clearly... I feel trying to make this a very isolated, very, very small, very local. And then just not. Um, and then on page 31, she starts traveling. This is when she starts to travel with uh, GM and Jeffrey Epstein at 14 years old in 1994. To, she travels to March around March, 2001, she says it's about 10 times. Um, on page 32, traveled to New York City, Santa Fe, Mexico, Santa Fe, Mexico by Jeffrey Epstein's private plane. GM traveled, she clearly says that she, Glean traveled every, you know, she was there. She, that Glean Maxwell facilitated these traveling she what she states throughout her whole testimony that pretty much Galene was right by not only right by his side, but she was very much involved in how things got done. Um, on page 34. Now we talk, this is where she starts talking about the New York house on the Upper East Side. Um, she talks about the painting, the naked women and the orgies. We're not just, you know, orgies, but other naked women. There are plenty of people here. I feel like this with Jane One's testimony alone, it is just dripping in who, who else, who was involved. These little webs can go, go so far. For anybody to think that this is was isolated in local, just a small little, has to really do research. And by the time we get through these transcripts, you will see that that is, it is not isolated. It is not local. There are huge, huge high profile people out there that need to pay for, for being complicit in any way that they have been. <clears throat> I've been writing down all the names. I will be dropping those too. So, and how they're related. You know, there are going to be plenty of names. That's why I'm saying that the flight plans and even the book are kind of circumstantial unless more victims come forward, which I really hope they do. But I'm telling you what is less is those audio tapes. What's less is the Rolodex that we haven't heard of that I've seen in the butler's testimony. I believe with those tapes and the Rolodex alone, it's a really, it's a really good place to start witnesses or not. I don't, I, I've, I find that 
I mean, and the Rolodex alone is a good place to go find more potential witnesses that will talk. So I really hope that that they're, they're, they have something going on. <laughs> I really do. I'm keeping the faith. I'm keeping it. So she talks about, so this is where, this is the Upper East Side house that we're talking about here in New York, okay? So let me just... So she talks about the paintings, the naked women, and the orgies. She says it's a cold, unwelcoming place. Orgies in massage room, mainly alone with Jeffrey Epstein. Jay Gillen would join sometimes. Felt like she was, Jane one specifically states that she felt like no matter what, she was always being watched. She said it was a red room giant massage table the new mexico then on page 37 she talks about the new mexico ranch um with jeffrey epstein and galene maxwell page 39 she also states interesting someone would come to jane one when it was time to see jeffrey epstein i want to know who was that person that came to get this 14 to 15 year old looking girl to go bring this man to the massage room or any room alone? I mean, just everything about this man from the paintings on his walls to the people that he hung out with just is dripping and everybody involved needs to pay. They need to I mean, I feel, oh, I just, my opinion about the butler, I, I hope you guys stick around and you like this. I know I gab a lot, but I think it's really important to ask these questions because I don't see the prosecution asking any of these questions and I want to know why, and I hope it's for something bigger. So I feel like we have this break in the case, so we need to go over it very, very slowly, if it makes sense. So, so with a New Mexico ranch, someone would come get Jane Doe when it was time to see Jeffrey Epstein. And I want to know who. Jay, on page 40, Jane once 15 at the time, had trouble flying because she did not have a license. She did not have a permit. She did not have a pass. She didn't have any of that stuff. So she states that Galeen made a call to get her on the flight. And just like that, you know, they, they have stressed to Jane Doe how well connected they are. They have made it very known that they know everybody. She says that they would be on the phone call and she would be, Jeffrey Epstein would name these people. Kind of, I mean, to boast, like, I know the, you know, who, look who I'm talking to. You know, they made it very well known that they were very well connected. Um, a name that came up while she was talking about how well connected they were was Mike Wallace. Um, I will, I will say that. Yeah. Um, she mentioned, you know, she mentioned Trump, Clinton, you know, and at the end, she also included a name, Mike Wallace, who I have written down as, I'm not familiar, 60 Minutes fame. Um, Jane Doe One met Mike Wallace in 1998 at his 80th birthday. So she has met, I don't know the connection. I'm just putting out names. I'm writing down all names. So that way we can keep track of the names that were, you know, closely related to the trial, I feel. So, yes. Mike Wallace, 98, 14-year-old Jane Doe, or, or Jane Doe one, sorry, met him at his 80th birthday, and he has 60 minutes of fame. Um... So 
I just wanted to point that out before we continue for anybody that wants to write down anything. Um, yeah, so all, all Galene Maxwell had to do with her well-connected people was make a phone call to this airport and this little girl with no ID, no permit, no anything could just be allowed on the plane. I just want to point that out. Um, on page 46, they start to talk about her home life. They, this is where they, you know, pretty much want to talk about why Jane one felt like she could not talk, you know, um, because the defense made, you know, and I just want to point out there is really not too many objection from the defense other than, oh, that's a wide time frame. You know, I just feel like, I don't know, the persecution could have pushed it a little bit harder, asked a little bit. I mean, yeah, what Mr. Elassi's testimony really gets to me. I can't wait to go over his. Um, So they're asking why Jane Doe never spoke up to her mother. Um, so back in the back when her father passed at the uh, the school she was at the Interlock uh, camp, she went to a guidance counselor, and she tried speaking to this guidance counselor about her father passing, and they would speak, and they would cut. You know, she would come in and talk to her a few times, and. Um, at some point, the guidance counselor called the mother and then the mother in return went to the daughter and pretty much told her to not speak on things that happen inside the family. So she really grew up in a house where you don't talk about it. You, she said, you know, her mother wasn't really supportive in the grieving process after losing her father. Um, yeah, and she pretty much was told right then, you know, you don't speak outside the house, uh, outside the house on things that go on inside the house. Um, so, and again, like with the Jeffrey Epstein, you know, her mother kind of gave me an impression through Jane Doe, like she didn't tell her mother these things, and then you have her, your mother over here saying, "Oh, you know, you're so lucky; they're interested in you." Um, you know, be appreciative that they're interested in you. Um, so she just, you know, it was just a very, a house that you just, and I'm sure a lot of people out there can relate, um, and being households where just, just things you just don't talk about. And I think that experience alone for Jane Doe at that young age really, really set a tone. Um, so and that was pre -Je Jeffrey Epstein. So when what happened with Jeffrey Epstein came along, by then she already understood very well and she knew very well. Um, if she couldn't talk about the death of her father with anybody, you know, brush it under the rug, deal with it yourself, push through. I understand why she didn't speak up. Um, on page 55, Jeffrey Epstein's sexual acts alone were most, she states that they were most common, but Glean would join in and so were other women. Next common were sexual acts with everybody else. So the most, so pretty much most of the time it was with Jeffrey, but sometimes Glean would join in. And then on top of that, there would be other women who joined. Who are these women? You know, whether they're victims or complicit, who are they? We need to know. I feel like we need to know. Um, so on page 56 to 57, um, she, she goes back, they go back to the Palm, the Palm Beach house. She states other women were present and involved in the sexual acts. Jeffrey Epstein would summon to follow him to Jeffrey Epstein's bedroom 
or massage room um, exhibit. Okay, so, you know, she clearly states that, yeah, Jeffrey, yeah, Galene, but there are other women that would go into this massage room. Orgies, she would state. You know, orgies to me says more than three people. Three people, that's a threesome. You have orgies, that means four or more, right? I could be wrong. Um... So they talk about this picture of, of Jane Doe one that was sent to Jeffrey Epstein. Um, it says, you rock my world. This photo, if we, I'm sure you've guys heard about it. I'm not sure if you've guys heard the details behind the photo, but this photo was, her mom was pretty much there. Her mother wanted her to send her a photo saying pretty much, Here's a photo. It was after she had gotten her first job, landed her first job. Um, and she pretty much, her mom wanted her to send the headshot. And, and on it, she said, you rock my world. And it was kind of made a big deal by the defense. But really, if you think about it, you got her mom. You know, the history, the brushing under the table, the be appreciative, the, you know, and the, you know, and not knowing I can understand, you know, the pressure of sending that picture. I I can relate. I can understand that. Um, for some reason, exhibits thirty. Um, that was exhibit two forty five. It was two pictures. One of them had the rock my world. Um, for some reason, exhibits three forty four and three forty seven are sealed. I'm not sure what they are. Um, on page 61, Jane, Jane won left Palm Spring or Palm Beach, Florida at 17 years old. She moved to New York City to, ascent, to attend professional children's school. Jane attended at 18 years old, paid for by, still being paid for by Jeffrey Epstein. This is her senior year of high school still engaged in sexual acts with Jeffrey Epstein, graduated, moved from New York City, October of 99. Now I want to go back here. So she moves to New York to this, to this professional school. Okay. You have to file an application. So interesting note, um, Jane says that the interlock ca uh, camp, the summer camp was paid from 1994 after, okay? She met him at her last paid for, you know, camp in 93 by her family. They paid for that. So Jeffrey started paying in 94, according to the trial transcripts. Jeffrey Epstein's name was not on the application when she checked. Um, do you want to receive financial aid? It was not checked. Jeffrey Epstein's name was nowhere on there. But interestingly enough, the same lady that gave her the letter of recommendation at the interlock summer camp, um, was the same lady at the professional um, children's school up in New York. So the all application process, the recommendation, and in the recommendation, they really talked up her family of being this like wonderful, supportive, um, obscene, you know, and Jane Doe really paints a picture of that's, that's not really how it was. Another interesting detail. So yeah, I figured I'd point that out before we jumped into New York. Yeah. The same lady all the way up to senior year dealing with the application process, 
is the same lady who seen young Jane Doe at 13, 14 years, gave a letter of recommendation for that summer camp. Interesting. I thought so. So, um, Jane Doe one moved to LA in Cal to LA, California in 1999, got a job on TV show. Um, she worked 22 years, stayed in touch, traveled, still traveling with, um, Jeffrey Epstein on his private jet in 2002. Um, that was the last contact. In 19 or um, on page 64, Jane Doe fell in love with someone, got engaged, fiance asked about Jeffrey Epstein still calling. And she tried to play it off as if, you know, it was my grandfather. Um, and when he still was very persistent, you know, the fiance was like, well, just stop calling him back. And Jane Doe one states that that's just not how it works with Jeffrey. Um, uh, Jeffrey becomes agitated, wanting to see her, leaving voicemail saying he's going to come meet her. Um, he becomes even more agitated, stating, "Remember what I have, what Jeffrey Epstein has done for her. Be grateful." Um, Interesting note, around the same time that he's doing this, um, Jane Doe's one, mom's one was still living in the apartment paid for by Jeffrey Epstein. Um, so, you know, she very much still, she, you know, she very much still had, had people that she cared about by that time. Her mom was, and I can understand why, after everything she's already been through with Jeffrey Epstein, um, yeah. She's very right. It just doesn't work like that. It doesn't. Um, so she does not end up, Jane one does not end up marrying this fiance. On page 65, Jane one starts dating someone new, tells him about Jeffrey Epstein and Galeen Maxwell. Abuse. 2007, this was from 2007 to 2013. Jeffrey Epstein started, started being what we thought was, this is around the time Jeffrey Epstein was what we thought he was being arrested. Um, he was around 2008. Um, Jeffrey is pretty much caught, um, in 2008, he was registered at, for the first time as a sex offender. Um, he was given a plea deal, pretty much keeping people like Je Glenn Maxwell, Pilot's client, secret and safe. He was given given 17 months. Again, this was in 2008. I don't know if he even served the whole 17 months, but that was when he was initially registered for a for being a sex offender. Um, Jane one talks with the FBI in 2019 after initially turning them down. Uh, you know, the defense wants to play a big part of this as a financial gain for Jane one, which I mean, in my opinion, after everything that Jeffrey Epstein's done to her, it's about time she gets some of that money without having to do anything sleazy. So, and they pay, you know, you ask any, it's just about them. They could probably walk away from with that, with no money, as long as every single person that ever had a part in doing anything to them gets taken care of. That justice is done. And I really hope by time all this is done, that that's how they feel, that they go after every single person around the sex trafficking ring that just Jane one Doe alone paints a very good picture of. That's all I'm saying. So she talks with, um, that's when she initially talks with, with the FBI. So that was the end of part one.
you know, there's two parts of the testimony. If you go to the rundown live, um, I, it is Kristen T. Kristen T. Harris. He has been inside the courtroom reporting. He is the host of Rundown Live. You can find all of the transcripts that he has out so far on his website. Up top there is his page. Um, I follow him religiously. I comment. I follow. I ask. Um, he. I want to make. I would love, love to do these transcript breakdowns and have him on my show to come talk because I would love to pick the brain. I can sit here and go through the transcripts, but he knows the environment of the courtroom. He knows how Galene was sitting, what she was looking like. He knows. Um, so that's why I've been trying to stay away from the headlines. Um, I did reach out to him and I asked him to come speak on my buried series um, and give me insight and let me pick his brain. So I'm really hoping that if he watches it, um, he sees us. Um, I would love for him to come on. He's, you know, he is very busy. He was also a witness to the Kyle Rittenhouse. So he's doing a lot right now. Um, I'm hoping since we have a break in the trial, if he gets a moment to breathe, to just come on my show and let me pick his brain. I would love to ask all my questions from to, to somebody that has actually been in the courtroom so I can get a full picture. I'm talking atmospheres here, things we cannot get outside the courtroom, things that we cannot experience just by reading the transcripts. I would love for him to be on the show. So if you're watching this and you follow him, shout me out. I would love to get him on here. Um, so yeah, that was the end. It's 74 pages. And then if you go scroll below that, it leads to the second part, which I said, I'm not going to speak so much on the defense, whatever. I don't really care to pick apart these victims. I don't really care to pick apart Jane Doe. I fully support her, fully believe her, fully believe that she needs to be there telling her story. And I fully believe that everybody outside those three people should be held accountable for this 14 to 15 year old looking girl that they all watched come in and out of this house full of naked pictures of women on the walls and massage rooms. And we will go more into detail with that with old Butler driver's testimony. So this is the second half. Um, Yes, so they start out with a glowing recommendation from woman on board of the Palm Beach School of Art, 13-year-old Jane Doe. Same woman was former director of professional children's school. That's what that's that point I wanted to make. Um, it was some the first one was submitted. October 1994 for the next summer of 95. Jane Jane one did a commercial in 94. Um, like I said, she did not, no financial aid. Um, same address for Jane one, summer of 96, new address, gated community. Um, page 90. Yeah, I jump from page six to page 13 to page 90 because that's full of, of stuff that I'm not going to pick apart. Um, summer of 96, new address, gated community. Um, met the dean of Juilliard, referred to professional child school by dean of admissions. I will have all these and my, <clears throat> all this in my list of names, um, even if I don't know their name, I'm going to have just that in there. I will have all of that as when I'm done with the transcript, going through all the transcripts, I plan to release that and go over that. Um, and then once I'm done going over all the transcripts, I plan on very slowly putting all these testimonies in a timeline and kind of giving it that chronological order. So, yeah. So I really hope you like what you've heard. I'm sorry I gab and I jump, but if you really listen, the information is there. I'm very new to this. 
Um, so I appreciate it. Um, so like and follow. I will be on sporadically because I'm trying not to get censored. Um, so summer 1996, new address gated community. Met the, met the dean of Juilliard referred to, in he, the uh, dean of admissions referred her to the professional child school. She met Trump when she was 14 years old at the Mar-a-Lago. Mar Mar now, there was no specifics question, nothing. No, no, that's what I don't understand. There is no elaboration on the women involved in these orgies. Um, there's just no elaboration on any part in that. And that's what makes me feel like they are really just trying to make this very localized, very small, very two sick people preying on young girls. And they covered it up and a massage ring, which is true. But they also had this whole ring of monsters involved also. So that makes it a sex ring. So she met Trump when she was 14 years old. Um, page 92, this is where it really, and I will have all these names on my list too. She says, Sophie, a professional massager or a, a professional masseuse lived in Florida, joined in several massages, knew the routine and she was on the flights. So when I think a professional masseuse and correct me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't you have to be, um, when you have to be 18 or older, when you have to be substantially older than a 14 year old girl. Um, I think you have to be, if she is a professional, to me that states more of the leaning towards the adult-ish. Um, but she definitely joined in the sexual massages, knew the routine like she had been around for a long time and she was on the flights page 93. So you really on for this one, you really want to go from 90 to the end 175. Um, so then we get to on page 93. This is the second part of Jane Doe testimony. Ava joined in sexual massages with Sophie, the professional masseuse who lived in Florida. Um, on page 94, Emmy was a part, now interesting. She says em Emmy was a participant in abuse, joined in sexual acts. So, we have Sophie, Ava, and Emmy. I do know Emmy, and I'm assuming it is Emmy Taylor. She is, she traveled with G, Galene Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein all the time. She was Galene Maxwell's assistant. Again, Emmy, also participant in abuse, joined in sexual acts. Page 94, we also have Michelle hung out with Jane one and Emmy. They went out together, joined in sexual massages. Page 95, we have Kelly. Jane one remembers last name. It was not given. Um, Ma, she was a model who Jane one thought was older than she was. On page 99, Jane flew on board at times with Adam Perry. Um, at, I'm sorry, Adam Perry Lang, Jeffrey Epstein's mother, Prince Andrews, Jeffrey Epstein's brother, Mark, um, driver Alessi drove her to the airport. On page 101, the New York mansion chef, there was a, sh there was a chef, house manager, driver, 
all new 14 year old Jane one was alone with Jeffrey Epstein. Page 102, Jane one would always receive money, two to three hundred dollars, whether she had given sexual acts or whether she is whether she had sexual acts done to her or not, she would give to her mother. And then finally, on page 175, we hear about the Black Book. But again, all these names, every single one of these people that, as much as they, they tried to keep it localized between Jane One, Jeffrey Epstein, and Glean Maxwell, it is dripping with orgies and women involved. It is dripping with a butler that worked with closely with Jeffrey Epstein from 1990 to what, 2002, three, one, around that time? That, and there's no questions being asked about them. And I could only only assume and only pray and I, I'm only hoping that it's because something bigger is coming. I hope that is something bigger coming. I know that with the FBI, with Ellie, there's a lot that we don't know about. But I really feel like the prosecution did not push. And I hope that it is a very for that reason. I feel like they teased us. They let us know that there were people, but they also, the if you notice, the people that they did bring up were people that were close. They were trying to keep it close. And that's not the case. I feel, I mean, I have at least, from the names that I've seen so far between transcripts and that have been out there, one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and then eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Between associates, between people that were close enough in that circle, between you know employees that worked with Jeffrey Epstein, those are just people that were close. And I know, I know between the flight plans, I know between the black book, I know between it all that every single name in there is, there's probably people in there that do have no idea, but you know what I think? I think while we're out here all <clears throat> arguing who's complicit, what name matters and what name doesn't. I think there's enough and they have enough and they found enough to know exactly what names they know exactly who they need to go after. They know exactly who is not involved. My question is, what are they going to do about it? That's the question that we need to be asking because they fully are aware of, of those, of the people that, that they need. They are at this point, there's no way that they can be with everything that they pulled out of the New York state alone, there's no way in there. The painting, there, there's no way. We, if you stick around for the Butler driver testimony breakdown, um, there is a Rolodex. And in that Rolodex, and I, I will say it now because it's in reference to Jane Doe 1, he explains that this Rolodex is a Rolodex full of massagers and clients. So in this, he states that he set up the appointments. He talked to people. He wrote down messages. So in this Rolodex, he goes in there and inside there is Jane Doe one, who, if you asked him, looked to be about 14 to 15 years old. He would go in this Rolodex, pull her name out, call her up, set up the massage, confirm the appointment, and then go drive to Jane Doe One's house, pick her up, drive her back to Jeffrey Epstein for this massage. And then he would go in and clean it up. So if you like this, please follow, share. While you're here, check out my other series. 
um, please share those. This is what I'm really here for. Um, I cover spotlight. I talk to, if I can, directly to families of um, murdered and missing that have not gotten the spotlight. That's what my page is about, is spotlighting true crime. And I really focus on missing and murdered, obviously, um, because that is very important. And everybody, no matter what their circumstance, needs to have a chance to have their loved one heard and have justice, bring them home, whatever their very specific and very tailored case needs. I just hope to give them the media treatment um, in hopes to sparking people to come and bring leads, information. But what I really try to do is I really try to find the groups that are ran by the family so I can speak as closely for them. If nobody else is listening to anything, I believe who the hell else are we supposed to listen to if not the family? So I go for them to get updates on what is happening through them. Um, right now I'm talking to Karen Bowden's mother, um, Carly. She, or Car sorry, Karen Bowden's daughter, Carly. Karen was murdered and her case remains unsolved. She will have a show tomorrow night on the ID channel. Um, the, uh, the series is called Still a Mystery and she will be on there talking about her mother. Um, and afterwards, I hope to have her on for kind of a question and answer. So please, you can check that series out. Um, if you like what we're doing here for the Barry Justice Series, Ghislaine Maxwell trial, um, please like and share and comment. Uh, I will be on next time to go over the Butler's testimony. I have already started down here below. Um, I've read through and now I'm going through and breaking down just like I did for the for Jane Doe one and I will also be posting my bullet points for Jane Doe one testimony I will type them out with the pages so that way you guys can go back in as a reference in this easy bulletin um point that I feel everybody should know you wouldn't you will know to go where to go find it so I will be making posts on everything that I talked about a post on everything that I talked about tonight. I will go through the Butler's. We will go through Carolyn's. We will go through Katie's. We will go through every transcript that um, Kristen T. Harris from the Rundown Live will allow or be able to obtain and put out for me. I hope to have him on here. I've reached out. He's very busy, but he says he wants to connect. So I'm hoping when he finds some downtime, he'll reach out because I would really like to pick his brain through all of these bullet points that I pointed out, all the questions I have. I would really like to ask them from a point of view from somebody who is in the courtroom. Um, I just want to hear his thoughts on why, why things are not being talked about. Why are they trying to make it very localized, very small, group of people here when it is a very, very wide, very high profile, very high profile name, sex trafficking ring. And I want to stress that. So like I said, like, follow, share, do what you do, comment. Let's talk about it. We need to talk about it because the more we talk about it, the more they cannot hide it. And hopefully we can start seeing more justice, the kind of justice where we're not questioning why are they even respectfully why are they even putting these girls through this trial in the first place? What is it going to lead to is what I want to know. So I'm keeping the faith. I'm hoping that they will blow this right out of the water. Um, it could, like I said, it could really change the tone for an, us as a nation. It could really show what we will not put up with. It could really be a turning point. We are at a point where we are not just keeping quiet. We are not just taking it. We are not just turning our cheeks. And the people in those seats need to feel the same. And everybody connected to this case needs to go no matter where they are. And we need to replace those with people that we can trust.
um, we need to replace them with people that want to set the same tone. This is the very case. They're calling it the case of the century, but I don't feel like it's the case of the century. So we need to make it the case of the century. So that is all I have for you. I know I gab, I know I gabble. I'm new. It should die down. Um, thank you for following along. If you listen and you pay attention through the rambling, the page numbers and the facts are there. We will be going through the butlers next. So please stay tuned for that. And um, I will see you next time. This is Ash with TC Spotlight. Until next time, please stay safe and have a good night.